Uh, while I agree with Popper that there are better things to argue both, the first it's okay to argue for the latter, because Popper himself objected to being labeled as a positivist, and I think he was right to do so, and why Hayek was right to object to being labeled a conservative. It's the negative connotations of those terms. And it's especially inappropriate, in my point of view, to label Hayek as a right-wing guru, which John Gray, once very sympathetic to Hayek and Popper, has done recently, or as a mainstream right-wing political thinker, which is done by the editor of this wonderful volume, and some of you must be Cambridge companion to Hayek. Fesser did an excellent job. He is an interesting, but he starts off putting Hayek as a mainstream right-wing political thinker. He said, why? Why do you do that? A huge rhetorical, I and mean, I've heard friends you know, of mine at Brock University who don't like Hayek dismiss you know, a right-wing nutcase and this kind of thing. But by conceding this gives a huge rhetorical advantage to his critics who can then put him in the same category as Hitler, Mussolini, and today's religious right. The tactic is not just inappropriate, I think it's grossly unfair. Hayek, like Popper, grew up in the society that produced the most extreme and destructive version of right-wing ideology in human history. Like Popper, and unlike all too many other intellectuals, both of them reputed and criticized fascism and Nazism, just as they, of course, repudiated and criticized communism was again not all intellectuals, as you know, have done. One of Hayek's, I think, most devastating criticisms of socialism is that it comes from the same source as that which produced the two ideologies of fascism and Nazism. Of course, some terms are ambiguous when it comes to connotations, for our purposes, especially liberalism. Hayek objected to its appropriation by his ideological opposites, which has happened in North America, but not only in the United States, but in Canada, the country I'm from as well. Okay, now, one of the reasons that it's extremely inappropriate to put Hayek in the conservative category, he's not a defender of either the status quo or the myth of the good old days. There is no nostalgia for the world we have lost, for the ancient regime of France, pre-industrial society of England, or any other pre-modern, pre-industrial society. Rather, and here is, I think, a beautiful expression of his liberal utopia. Quote, in their efforts to make explicit the principles of an order already existing but only in an imperfect form, Adam Smith and his followers developed the basic principles of liberalism in order to demonstrate the desirability of their general application. Another crucial point is Hayek's attempt to exhibit how the spontaneously generated market order makes cosmopolitanism possible. And like John Lennon, Hayek is a genuine cosmopolitan that wants to see the world live in peace and possibly brotherhood. I'm not going to get into spontaneous order. I'm going to leave that to Jean Paulo. To, to, I'm looking forward to the European. It better be really good. Is it? I'm not, but I want to touch on the connection with cosmopolitanism. It's an order which has grown beyond being high experts, the family, the horde, the clan, the tribe, principalities, and even empire or nation state. It's what Paul Seabright calls the great experiment in his The Company of Strangers. Very interesting book, because I don't think, because I think Seabright strikes me as not, I don't think he ever mentions Hayek or gets into that, uh, but what he's arguing is a very Hayekian uh, point, of, uh, point of view, uh, that the uh, spontaneous order of the market leads to cosmopolitans and providing for the needs of strangers all over the world that we don't know. Uh, for a person who grew up in a society that was both multicultural, and I'm talking about Hayek, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and acutely intoxicated with a sense of its own superiority, <clears throat> Hayek is amazingly lacking in chauvinism of any kind, national, racial, <clears throat> even cultural, and he was cosmopolitan in the best sense of that much abused and consistent term. It's why he advocated complete free trade for the whole world. An important point for any free market apologist is liberal, again, his words, liberalism is inseparable from the institution of private property. This means, according to Hayek, 
an emphasis on confining the coercive powers of government to enforcement of universal rules of just conduct. Uh, now, this principle does not preclude state provision of desirable goods and services that the market does not provide or which it does not provide in sufficient quantities. And here is a proper differs from the uh, uh, libertarian utopianism of many uh, free market defenders like uh, Anne Rand, Murray Rothbard, part of the Austrian tradition, and Jan Lester, who's an interesting, uh, when I was at, uh, at the Popper Centenary Conference in 2002, uh, I wrote a paper comparing Malachi Hockahin and Jan Lester. Uh, Hockahin, who wrote a wonderful biography, well, half biography of Popper, wants to take him into an egalitarian utopian direction. Jan Lester wants to take Popper into a libertarian utopian uh, direction. And where Hayek mainly deliver, differs from the libertarians is he's willing to defend a moderate welfare state, unlike uh, Ayn Rand or uh, Nozick. In fact, I remember reading Ayn Rand said Hayek was worse than the communists. That was her comment on the road to certain. I couldn't believe anyone could say something so stupid, but anyway. Uh, but he differs from the libertarian utopians uh, who want to get rid of the welfare state as opposed to reform it, which I think Hayek would do. Now, in Chapter 5 of my book, I compare Popper's five-point summary of justice from the Open Society, Chapter 6, uh, with Hayek's as found in studies in uh, politi or philosophy, politics, and economics. Uh, he discusses four principles here in detail. And I'll just briefly touch on them because, again, they're part of, I think, his liberal utopia. There is no test or criteria for social justice. Uh, this is one point where I agree with Hayek almost uh, 100%. I think this is the second strongest argument after the economic calculation argument. Uh, one of Shermer's comments, it surprised me that Shermer says this. Uh, says that uh, Hayek's critique of social justice, in it he expressed himself poorly and should be understood as claiming that the ideal of social justice, understood as people being rewarded on the basis of what they merit, cannot be realized in a commercial society. Well, my comment on this is that Hayek does say what Shermer correctly interprets him as meaning on more than one occasion. Uh, here he is arguing that in apparently meaningful terms, social justice has no clear criterion for its use. He calls it meaningless, which makes him sound somewhat like a positivist, but he isn't using the logical positivist uh, criterion of meaninglessness. Second point in his theory of justice, the generally negative character of rules of justice, which he says, will often notice has scarcely ever been thought through to its logical uh, consequences. Third principle is John Locke's triad of rights, life, liberty, and property, which eventually made it into the uh, U.S. Uh, Constitution, and is uh, the basic principle underlying Robert Nozick's libertarian uh, utopian philosophy of the 1970s. His fourth principle, an extension of Immanuel Kant's test of universalizability. Um, okay, actually, yeah, one other thing I want to say is uh, he gets into a critique of the whole idea of, of social justice, in particular the idea of a just price and just wage. He has an interesting point that the uh, schoolmen of the late medieval and early modern period who defined just price and just wage defined it in Austrian terms. Uh, the price or ways that would form itself on a market in the absence of fraud, violence, and coercion. And if I'm not mistaken, these were Spanish scholastics that he quotes in the late uh, medieval, early uh, modern, uh, modern uh, period. Now, one of his most important points, where he's, and this is where, when I get to the part, uh, the second part, I'm going to contrast him with Alistair McIntyre, who's defend, and defends a post-Marxist utopian uh, vision. 